And I think that's when I realized, wait, my bills are going to be the same for the next five years. And we're having all this money coming in. I could pay off my loans. I, could, I don't have to wait until the end. Um, and I think that's what kind of like started opening up my eyes. Welcome to the Personal Finance for PhDs podcast, a higher education in personal finance. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Roberts. This is season four, episode 10. And today my guest is Dr. Indira Turney, a postdoc at Columbia Medical Center. Indira tells the incredibly impressive story of how her finances changed over the course of her PhD at Penn State. Indira started graduate school with approximately $60,000 of debt in a variety of forms and no idea where her income from the previous year had gone. On top of that, she realized that she was taking an income cut to approximately $20,000 per year for her stipend. She resolved to turn things around, and by the time she graduated, she was debt-free with cash savings and investments in a Roth IRA. Indira details the multiple strategies she used to increase her income and minimize her expenses. Her methods are both creative and highly accessible for other graduate students, and we could all do well to adopt her attitude toward income and finances. Without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Indira Turney. I'm delighted to have joining me today on the podcast, Dr. Indira Turney, and she has a really remarkable financial story to tell from her time in graduate school and since. So Indira, will you please tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. I'm happy to be here, and thanks again for inviting me on the podcast. Um, So I'm currently a postdoc at Columbia Medical Center in New York City, and I graduated from just quickly from the University of the Virgin Islands with my bachelor's. Then I went on to do a pre-doctoral program at the University of Pittsburgh for about a year, and then I went on to earn my PhD in cognitive neuroscience at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. Um, And now I'm currently, which I just said a postdoc um, at Columbia Medical Center, where my research essentially focuses on, I guess, using molecular and functional neuroimaging to identify social cultural sources and neural correlates of Alzheimer's disease across diverse racially and ethnic populations. That is awesome. Uh, Thank you for telling us about that. Um, So financially, Where were you at the start of graduate school? So when I started grad school, I had about about 60,000 in debt. Um, At the time, I never really calculated it specifically, but I had like a card um, loan. I had um, about 20,000 in student loans and I had some health insurance stuff that I hadn't paid off fully and some credit card bills. So in total, about 60,000. Yeah, that's a pretty heavy debt load for a grad student, Um, and especially because with all student loans, of course, you'd be able to defer that and, and not pay attention to it. But with other types of debt, you still have to address it as a graduate student. So okay. what, what was your income during graduate school? Um, so my first year, I had the regular base um, pay up about, I think it's about nineteen fifty um, on a monthly. So about 19000 a year. Um, and that's what I, we got to cover stipend. And then they paid tuition as well if you're as a teaching assistant. Um, that's what I had the first year. And then after that, with applying to other things, I essentially increased that um, based on how much funding I got that year. So can you give me like a range for your subsequent years in graduate school of what you were earning? So for a year, as far as grad school funding for years two, three, and four, I got an NSF grant. So I went from 19000 to 35000 um, So that was a huge increase. Um, and then in addition to that, I also had... Ooh. So my last year I got off of NSF because it was only three years and I went back to the regular base pay of 1950. Because I was an NSF for three years, I also kind of negotiated having a, a little extra. So I had about 23 or 22,000 a year. Um, in addition to, I also had other grants and funding, which probably at max it was about 25,000 a year um, from graduate funds as far as stipend goes in my last year. So anywhere between 19000 to 36000 so, And it was just five years during your PhD, is that right? Six years, actually. Six years, right. So the last two years, yeah. And you said a word that I love to hear, which is negotiate. Can you tell yeah. me really briefly about negotiating? 
Sure. So essentially, especially in my sixth year, um, when you're past, so technically the program is five years. And if you're more than that, they tend to bump you down as a way to like push you out. And so I was, I essentially was like, no, I'm not going to get paid 18 thousand dollars a year I saved you guys a whole lot of money for three years by getting an NSF funding and and even while I had NSF funding I technically taught a class which I wasn't necessarily supposed to um, and so I was just like I did a lot for the university especially for this department you're not gonna bump me down if anything you guys should increase my stipend and so not in those words of course and so I think there's always room for asking for more money because there's always money there because technically they gave you uh, in your letter in the beginning this is your five-year funding there is money there so if you told me there was money there for five years I deferred for three years then there's money there so don't tell me I used up your money for six years you know so I think there's always ways to negotiate and tell them like this is what you're worth and you're always worth more than what they give you and if you ask there's usually a lot of room for um, extra money I, I know you didn't, you just said you didn't use those words, but I really love the words that you just said. And I'm so pleased to hear them. I think a lot of people need to hear them about, about your, about your value. And especially if you went outside funding, yeah, of course they should extend your tenure and increase your pay. But I was just very interested in hearing that you actually did that negotiating after the NSF concluded. Yeah. Um, and so there's still room, like even, um, you know, what, when the money is yet to come in, even after the money has already, you know, passed through the system, in your opinion, and in your example, the money was still there, you said the right words, you unlocked the money. Um, and in those last two years, were you doing like an RA or did you have to TA or where did the money actually come from? Um, I did a mixture of both. So I TA'd where I taught a class because after your master's, you can actually teach versus just correcting papers, I guess. Um, and then I also did an RA fellowship with my, um, my lab advisor where essentially I just did the work in the lab and got paid for it instead of teaching a class or instead of taking away time from my research. Um, and then I also got another award that bought off some time where I didn't have to TA that year, where even though I was getting funded by the university, I still didn't have to TA for that semester. So I really only taught like two years out of the six years and on and off half a semester here and there. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So start of graduate school. Um, things are actually not looking too great for you at the start of graduate school. Approximately $60,000 worth of debt, not a very generous stipend, although probably okay, given where you were living. Right. But then second year and following, buku bucks, at least for the right. time you were on the NSF. So where were you? What's the snapshot of your financial picture upon you know, your defense when you finished graduate school? Oh, upon defending, I was completely out of debt. Like I had zero dollars in debt. Um, I try to pay off everything. So, so my goal was paid off in five years and I paid it off in four and a half. Um, so my last year I had absolutely no debt at all. My car was paid off. I had repaid all my student loans, um, except for maybe like a thousand dollars that I think is lurking somewhere from undergrad. Because the 20,000 I had was for my first year of grad school because I had moved away from the Caribbean to the United States. And so I felt like I needed the extra money. Um, but I had about two thousand dollars in undergrad which those are deferred because i'm still technically in school but your grad school loans they um, accrue interest while you're in grad school so i was determined to pay off that before i graduated so on graduation day defense day i was completely out of debt which was amazing so yeah so just so i'm clear about where the student loans came from that was from the year that you were in school prior to starting your PhD, is that right? No, so the year prior to starting my PhD, that was also another um, fully funded, I think we got like $2,500 a month for a year or eight months pre-doctoral program. Um, and then went before, right before I started grad school, so I applied for like financial aid um, for a student loan. And so at the start of grad school, I had like a $20,000, I, I don't know what it's called, but essentially it was a loan from the federal government and it accrued interest every month once you started grad school. Um, yeah. So. Okay. So you had, so you had taken out a $20,000 student loan, but you also had the loan money. Like that was, you had, re you received it at that time at the beginning yeah, of graduate so they school. Gave it to you, um, essentially they give you the loan from the beginning. Um, and then you decide, which was scary. Cause I'm like, I have $20,000. What am I going to do with it? But the point was for moving expenses and living and, um, you know, other things that I didn't account for moving from the Caribbean. And so I had that. And from day one, I guess it started accruing interest. So when you get like that first bill of like, Oh, you, you know, 
earned or accrued about $50 in interest because I think it was like a 6% or 7% interest rate. And I was like, what? And I didn't even know that at the time when I applied for it because I assumed I'm in school and I'm not going to be paying off or um, getting interest while I was in school, but not for grad student loans apparently. Yes. So. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to get to get a little bit more clarity on that. So you took out the loan at the beginning of graduate school, um, which was unsubsidized as graduate student loans are um, because of the expenses that you had just accrued immediately before that in the moving expenses and so forth. And also just, I'm assuming you're looking at your stipend thinking, how am I going to do this? <laughs> um, okay. So you had that loan right at the beginning, but then by the end of it, you had paid that loan back entirely um, as well as the rest of your debt. Anything else going on in your financial picture by the time you finished graduate school? Um, um, so at that time I had, I had started saving about maybe by my third year of grad school, I had started saving um, just regular savings in a bank. Um, and then I also started investing in a Roth IRA where I ranged from putting in monthly about a hundred dollars I started with, and then maybe I upped it to about $300 a month. Um, so I had a Roth IRA and regular savings at the end of grad school and zero debt, which was amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds fantastic. And what a what a turnaround story, right? So what were you doing in between point A and point B to, you know, have this this vast change? Right. So essentially I applied to everything, including large grants up to forty thousand, fifty thousand, or if you count for stipends, some of them were eighty, a hundred thousand dollars, um, to things that were even just five hundred dollars um for anything. So whether it's for research and what I did was that was so for example, if you go to a conference and they give you per diem where you have about maybe ninety dollars a day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I don't need ninety dollars a day for food. I don't normally spend that anyways. And so yes, I can't meal prep while I'm on a conference, but I usually don't have breakfast anyway, so I'm not gonna waste thirty dollars on breakfast. So even though so when, I, so when I go back from the conference, especially say a week long conference, I now probably save at least $30 for five days from a conference that I didn't have breakfast. And most conferences probably give you coffee and bagels in the beginning anyways. And so most times I probably spend most of the money on dinner because that's when you network with um, colleagues in the field. And so $30 for breakfast and maybe about $50 for lunch. So $70 for five days that I would save. I think that was one of the easiest ways in the beginning that I learned to save money from like money that I got legally to be like, you know, legally I'm saving this, but I'm not, you know, forging signatures to say I, you know, didn't have lunch or something like that. Um, not signatures, receipts, sorry, <laughs> because with per diem, they're not asking for receipts. Um, and then the other um, method were, so I meal prep, so I didn't have to buy lunch because as grad students, I think it's so easy to, you know, run to the cafe and get something here. Um, long nights, you get food here, but I generally meal prepped most times um, on like Sundays I have these mason jar salads that towards the end of grad school I learned was amazing and so I would prep five and that's lunch for the week so I have no excuse to like you know buy lunch um, especially since a salad costs like ten dollars when I probably spend fifteen dollars for five salads a week um, I, I had fun I hung out with friends but I always planned it um, not the specific event but planned that okay for this month I'm spending 120 on you know fun and by the halfway of the month, I'll check in. Where are you in that 120? And so that, because I feel like once I'm out, I'm like, well, I'm out. I'm going to have fun. I'm not going to like, you know, make finances keep me down. And so I just spend whatever versus if I know I'm within my budget, it doesn't matter. But if I didn't plan for it, then I overspend. Um, I also did a lot of side hustles um, in addition to funding um, federal money um, where I did hair braiding, um, dog and cat sitting, uh, house sitting was my first summer when I moved. I moved about two months early before grad school. And instead of paying for rent, I essentially house sat for someone and they had a cat and so house and cats after that two months um and I also did Airbnb um with my apartment so in PA it was a lot cheaper than New York so I was able to have a two-bedroom apartment um and I on football weekends at Penn State is a big football school so from Friday evening someone would come and leave early Sunday morning and in just one weekend I could make anywhere between six to eight hundred dollars and so I would just go bunk on someone's couch and leave my entire apartment for someone because even within the town they knew it was a um, football weekend was big so hotels would be about 400 a night and so instead of paying 400 a night for a bedroom they'd easily pay 400 a night for a whole house and so I did football weekends about maybe five or six times a semester in the fall and that would essentially be my roommate um, so I didn't even though I had a two-bedroom I didn't need a roommate um, and then on graduation weekends I also did which is in May or December but usually the May graduation weekend 
hotel rooms would be like eight, nine hundred dollars as well. And so I would rent out my entire home again. And on graduation weekends, I think I did it twice. And one time I got about fifteen hundred dollars for just the weekend. Um, and I don't remember the second time how much it was, but it was around that. So side hustles, applying for everything and also meal prepping saved me a lot and planning my expenses for even fun. Yeah, that was an amazing amount of information, an amazing like overview of what, of what you were up to. Um, I want to, I, I want to follow up on a lot of that stuff, but just before, um, we get there. So when you started graduate school and you had this, this lower stipend level, and then, you know, in the next year you vastly, I mean, the NSF stipend is so much higher than what you were making. So you had this vast income increase. Um, did you change anything in between those two years or were like, were you living in the same place, for example, um, between the first year of grad school and second. yeah, so like I'm kind of wondering like if you sort of set up your life in the first year to live off of that you know twenty thousand dollars per year ish, but then you had that vast income increase. Did right. you increase your lifestyle or did you keep your lifestyle at that original level? No. So at the very beginning, I was making about eighteen hundred dollars a month, and so I lived in a I lived in a one bedroom, but technically it was actually more expensive than the two bedroom I moved into because it was like a apartment complex versus someone who had a home, and they were like, "Yeah, you can live here," kind of thing from Craigslist. <laughs> um, and so I didn't intentionally necessarily go cheaper so that was really the only thing that changed i probably i think i was paying like 975 for a one bedroom and then i paid like 950 for a two bedroom so it wasn't necessarily a big change um i still i had a car so that I, all of those things remained the same um side hustling if anything i started airbnb my second year so even after i got nsf it was when i started because that was like my biggest paying side hustle um so lifestyle wise most of the things stayed the same because and which is, I think, one of the beauty of grad school, your bills, your lifestyle, for the most part, stays the same for at least five years. And so I think for things like that is what kind of I started realizing. And I had did a, um, I did a workshop from the Black Graduate Students Association, and they had something about financial literacy. And I think that's when I realized, wait, my bills are going to be the same for the next five years. And we're having all this money coming in, I could pay off my loans, I, could, I don't have to wait until the end. Um, and I think that's what kind of like started opening up my eyes. But as far as lifestyle no those things pretty much stayed the same for five years aside from like emergencies and stuff like that and just like maybe a little more traveling towards the end but the basic lifestyle remained the same okay so really what happened is you know you had your lifestyle set at that original stipend level level that you were receiving um and then your income vastly increased both from the nsf and from your side hustling right. and so were you just like crazy throwing everything at debt like that was a huge goal that you had um, like, what were you doing with that excess? Right. So in the beginning, I wasn't. In the beginning, it was more so I never used to save. So like I said, the year before I started grad school, I did that pre-doc program. And we got about $2,500 a month. And we didn't have to pay for housing because all of that was paid for. And I don't know where that $2,500 went for eight months. And so when I started grad school and I realized I'm getting paid less than I was getting paid at the pre-doctoral level, I was like, wait, this makes no sense. Like, where did that money go? So I need to learn to start saving. So I started just putting that extra money in savings, but then realizing, of course, I'm not getting a big return. And then uh, those debt, those bills keep coming back. And I'm like, why am I just letting this accrue interest for the loans? So then I started put, paying just the interest rates and stuff like that. Um, but really it was more about... I think I just didn't want to be in debt. And I realized that I have all this money coming in in grad school and a lifestyle that's going to be the same for five years. And I started realizing that I was blessed to not have a hundred thousand dollars in just undergrad debt alone. Cause a lot of my friends did. Um, and so I was like, and they just have that sitting there because it's not accruing interest and that's fine. But I realized to a lot of them were taking that money and living a more, you know, luxurious lifestyle now in grad school because like, yeah, we're getting all this money and we could live a, you know, pretty decent lifestyle depending on how much money you get coming in. But I'm like, but why not just pay off the other debt? Because then guess what? When you're done with grad school, the debt is still there waiting for you versus live a balanced lifestyle and pay off your debt. So I think it was, it wasn't like a big, I have to pay off 60,000 in debt. It was more so, I was just more aware of where my money was going. And one thing after another just led me to investing and putting it into different things. Yeah. I'm really glad that you had that sort of realization, right? So you had this one year in the pre-doc program where you were making a pretty okay amount of money for a stipend. 
but it was, but where was it going? And you sort of had a reevaluation point, like, okay, I don't know what just happened to all of that. I obviously have to change some things within like my financial management um, going forward. Yeah. And that also, it sounds like you also sort of um, went to some financial literacy events or like a course or something. And that also helped you think differently about your money during graduate school and realizing that you had the ability to work on it right then and didn't all have to wait for the end. Right. Because unfortunately, I think a lot of us are just not taught about how to use the money we get. And so then when we get it, naturally, we're like, oh, my God, I have all this extra thousand dollars a month. Maybe I'll go somewhere, travel, do something, which is nice. But I mean, I think that course, that, that workshop from the Black Graduate Student Association definitely opened up my eyes. Yeah. Sounds super valuable. I will make a shameless plug for my own services here. Probably not exactly the same as what you experienced, but I do offer seminars and webinars for universities, specifically for grad students and postdocs on, I don't call it financial literacy, but I call it personal finance. So anyone out there who's looking for that kind of programming that can be incredibly life-changing, uh, please think of me. My website, pf4phds.com slash speaking is where you can go to find out more about that. Back to Indira's story. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we've, we've seen the beginning and the end point. You've talked about a few of the strategies that got you from uh, point A to point B. I want to dive into each of them a little bit more. Okay. So as you said, you know, you were applying for everything to increase your income, including, I mean, obviously you won the NSF. You've already mentioned that. That's awesome. Uh, probably the biggest difference of, any, of anything that happened. Um, and as well, you were talking about how you were using um, – per diems from conferences, but just being frugal, right, around your food spending. So instead of spending 100% of what you were given, that really is a little bit of like windfall money. Like you come home from a conference, you realize, okay, I was receiving X amount of money. I only spent whatever it was, 50% of that. Um, hey, a little bit of extra money. Um, and that's something that I, I think having a plan for, that's what I call like kind of windfall money, like unexpected money that enters into your pocket somehow. Um, did you just like throw that towards whatever your current goal was, savings or debt? Like, how did you think of it? Yeah. So in the beginning, whatever extra I had, I just had it in savings. And then I realized my savings was looking really nice. And I was like, but what am I doing with this money? Like, okay, I'm not like, I don't have kids. I don't have, like I send money home to family and stuff in the Caribbean. But aside from that, like I didn't have a need to have a big cushion, especially like I said, again, like I know I'm not going to get laid off of grad school more or less to say. So I didn't have to have this big cushion in case I lost my job. So I was like, what am I going to do with that? But yeah, in the beginning I put everything in savings and then I started doing the Roth IRA because I'm like, oh, well maybe I can get a bigger return there. And then I, now as a postdoc, I'm doing some break investments as well but at that time it was just a Roth IRA and savings and also then I started calculating okay so now if I have this in, in my Roth and this in my savings where there's still a life happens emergency you know kind of thing in my savings the extra I put towards starting to pay off my student loans and my I'm putting a little more than just I think at one point I just put a lump sum on my car payment so that way in case something happened I just didn't have to, like the feeling of every month I had to pay a certain amount and if I didn't then all of a sudden it's a problem and so I just put a lump sum down so technically I was always about three months ahead of my actual payments due um, and yeah so started with savings then um, the raw off and then started paying off the student loan and the car loans and like the other health insurance and credit card debt with like the highest interest rate from there and just started working my way down. And I think like one thing I liked what you said too is that that extra money I never, even with budgeting, so I never, when I budgeted my, so budgeting, I had like a monthly income, then I said this is what I'm spending. And when I calculated my spending, I had fixed flexible, where fixed is like the things that you need. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. And the flexible is like Netflix or eating out and stuff like that. And so those were budgeted based on my $1,800 a month. Um, and then when I had NSF, it was budgeted on my $3,500 a month. And then all the extra stuff, I never budgeted. Those just went into my savings and paying off debt. So I never felt like I was using it more or less. And then extra stuff that I use for extra fun. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah. Thanks for going into that detail about your budgeting. Um, you also mentioned that you had tried out several side hustles. And I wanted to know, because a couple of them are pretty accessible. Okay. So the first one that you mentioned was um, house sitting or cat sitting, which mm -hmm. basically meant that you didn't have to pay rent for two months. Gotcha. And this is like sort of a holy grail of, of things to pursue, right? So like, how did you land that gig? So the, the house sitting the first semester was 
I told my advisor that I wanted to move early and do an RA ship, so a research assistant ship. So she paid me, you know, what they would pay a regular RA. And I also asked her if they were, because on the faculty list, there's always people going on sabbatical or going away for the summer for a month or during the summer. I know a lot of faculty members from being at Pittsburgh, I know a lot of them were going away for about at least a month and they were looking for places or people to house it or cat sit if they had um, pets. And so I was like, oh, I wonder if people at Penn State do the same thing. And lo and behold, they did. And there happened to be a faculty member who was going for the two months that I needed a place before grad school. And so my, I asked my advisor, she gave me a few different people who were looking. I reached out to them, told them I was moving, going to be a very responsible grad student. And I would love to, you know, take care. At the time, I didn't have a dog, so I didn't have any, you know, recommendations about being a pet sitter. But I mean, I was a cat. So I think it was easier to sit a cat. Um, and yes, yeah, so I just applied and, you know, reached out to people and interviewed through Skype and stuff like that. And then moved all my stuff into their basement <laughs> until I was ready to move into an apartment for grad school. Thank you so much for sharing that because that's, I, I, as I said, it's, I think it's very accessible. It's maybe not something you do 100% of the time. And obviously later on you you know, rent an apartment. You didn't end up doing that 100% right. of the time. But for a, a bridge kind of period of time, it's really perfect. And again, for the summer, as you said, faculty do travel quite a bit. Even someone going on, you know, sabbatical or whatever um, right. could be longer than that. But yeah, that's, it's so, what you did is so easy to do. You asked yeah. your advisor, you got some recommendations, you followed up with those people, you, yeah. you know, you like sometimes our advisors may not know, but even like once I was in grad school, I also knew of people who were um, who needed um, house sitters. And so I think even asking just the grad students, do you know any faculty member who needs someone is another way to go about it, especially again, even sabbatical. I never did it, but for sabbatical, if someone's going away for a year, that's a year you can save in rent. And I know one person who did that. So there's definitely ways to save for rent. <laughs> you know someone who house sat for like a year or like nine months? Yeah, it was a little tricky. So she like house sat for about four months because it was half a, um, a sem half a year. So it was just a semester. Um, and so she just stayed at their house for, and she still had her apartment, but she had a partner. So, you know, he had to stay there and whatnot. But assuming she didn't have a partner, that would have been saving rent for an entire three, four months. And so... I think, you know, if I know other faculty members who leave for eight, six, eight months or like, because usually two semesters, I guess. Um, and if they have a pet, that's usually the key thing where they need someone to stay there because they can't take the pet with them or they rather not. Um, and so they usually just have students even just come and check in. Um, but because usually we have our things set and we don't want to like, it. especially in a small town, it was a little tougher because you can't get a six month lease or three month lease type thing. It's always a 12 year lease. So you don't want to break your lease. But given that opportunity, depending on the state that you're in, the city, you would be able to just stay at that person's place. So, yeah. Yeah. This is a great idea for anyone who's, again, doing something like moving somewhere on a little bit of an off schedule from what the market right. is, you know, accustomed to. Um, that's amazing. And then um, what were the other side hustles that you mentioned? Um, I did some hair braiding. So doing people's hair. Um, I have locks now, but before that I did all kinds of hair, you know, all kinds of races too, especially being in um, state college where a lot of the faculty members, their kids wanted braids, for example, but obviously not a lot of, I, I know a lot of friends, for example, who braid hair, but it's a little tricky to braid like ethnic hair versus, you know, someone who's white or Hispanic It's a little different. Um, and so I just, you know, braided all kinds of, I would do the kid hair and of course they'd love it and be excited and be like, oh my God, I want his ear to my hair all the time. So that was a client automatically at least once a month. Um, and then I also did Airbnb. Right. Airbnb. Yeah. That was the other thing I wanted to follow up with you about. It's just, yeah. it's very evident to me that you have this like I don't know if I want to say entrepreneurial, but just like you just go after things, right? Like you just take opportunities like, you know, as you see them, which is amazing. Um, so the Airbnb thing I think is so clever. And it's again, something that I haven't um, heard of from a PhD before. So I wanted to talk to you about it a little bit more. Um, so you were renting during this time, right? And was that kind of usage of your rental in accordance with the lease? Yeah, so um, I know in New York, there's a lot more. I didn't realize there were so many restrictions with um, Airbnb. Um, I know there were some rental properties in um, State College that didn't allow Airbnb. I was pretty upfront with my neighbors. There were these old little couples, so they were pretty flexible. Um, and I told them, you know, I'll have people coming into my, I didn't say Airbnb because I didn't think they knew what Airbnb was anyways. But I was like, I have people who will be visiting and they would stay here on the weekend, especially a football weekend, Friday to Sunday. I will make sure they don't damage anything. 
Um, everything will be my responsibility, although Airbnb, I think, reimbursed up to like a million dollars in damage. Never had that issue. Um, but I essentially just reaffirmed them that I will have strangers in my apartment for short periods of time, and I will make sure that they don't disturb the neighbors or anything like that. Uh, but if you have a problem, let me know. And after, I think, they never lived close to me anyways. And like I said, they were older couple. Um, so maybe there was um, some leeway there. But I think as long as I made sure, and even after I started doing Airbnb, I told all my friends about it because I was like, yo, there's so much money to be made here. Um, and some of them illegally did it and others were, their apartment people were fine with doing it as well. And so for the most part, I think it, w it depends on the city. I think New York is definitely a big no-no. Um, but in PA, unless it was one of those big, fancy, new student-based apartments, most apartments allowed it. Yeah, this is definitely something that if someone's interested in this idea, they definitely just have to keep on top of the regulations because it can change really right. quickly. But yeah, in your place and time, it sounded like it was perfectly acceptable. And the numbers you were throwing out earlier were very impressive for the oh amount God. of money you were able to rent for, especially the graduation weekends. But yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, you saw, you know, a huge influx of people coming in for game day, coming in for graduation, and right. you saw what hotels were charging, and you just said, well, I have a place to offer too. Right. Um, so that's just amazing that you did that. It sounds like some of other people were doing as well. So it's not like you were the only person who like no, thought of yeah, it. I, mean, I think about maybe four or five of us did. And I mean, I don't know anyone who was doing it before me. Um, not that I'm like the person who told everyone about Airbnb, but I think everyone was a little hesitant about having someone in their apartment. Is someone going to steal my stuff? And so I think after just being like, no, there's no harm because Airbnb also reimburses you up to like a million dollars what they say anyways. Um, and then also I think just when I got a dog it got a little trickier so towards the end of grad school I had a dog and it was easy for me to just go stay on someone's couch because you know you have friends you're probably spending the, the night there anyways but with a dog you have to bring a crate you have to you know and then if they don't are not allow dogs in their apartment that gets a little tricky so I would do it a little less frequent um, when I had a dog and then the last year I just didn't at all because it just beca became inconvenient for both me and him and my friends and so but I think without a dog or if it's a really small dog where you don't have to bring a crate and all that stuff then I think that was more flexible too or like my friends if they did it a weekend I would you know take their cats and stuff and because it's easy with a cat and stuff so yeah I just think it depends but for the most part it was I think my most favorite side hustle because it brought in the most money for the least effort um, and then the second one would have been like hair braiding because I just love doing hair um, but yeah 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 that sounds incredible and I think this is again potentially very accessible for other people who live in college towns who can see the same patterns emerging of people flooding into the city for you know big events yeah i mean anywhere like even especially especially college towns that have football games because people are just going to spend money they're coming with families they want more you know a big place or a place that versus just a hotel room and there's a really low risk because the whole day Saturday at there at the game. So they're not really there. And you can decide whether or not you want them to have parties at your house or not. And then so they usually leave early Sunday morning and they come late Friday night. So it's really a one full day that they're there. And even now in New York, I was looking into it before um, um, I found out that you had to do at least 30 days or something like that. And New York would be a good place too if it wasn't the 30 day limit, because again, it's just another place where people are always coming in. So I think as long as it's a place that people like to visit, I think you can do it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited about this. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay. So now, you know, we've talked a lot about your time in graduate school. Now that you're a postdoc and you have, you know, even, even more experience and in a different city now as well. So you have a whole different set of challenges. Um, what does your budgeting method look like today? What are your best practices? Um, so I still use the same thing. I have a monthly budget. I have fixed and flexible income um, spending and I still pay off my credit card in full kind of thing. Um, recently, I've been experimenting with just trying to calculate um, the percentage of things that I'm spending for each expense, you know, because, you know, the whole don't spend more than 30 percent on rent kind of thing. Exception, so, New York. Exactly. I'm like, I don't have a choice. <laughs> and so just um, being just to have a better sense of my income and where it's going and what I'm doing, because I think I have I'm, in grad school, for example, like I said, I just had, 
you know, my main fix went um, flexible and everything else just went to debt. But now that I don't have necessarily debt to pay off, but I have a huge rent and living expense, I just want to know where that money's going. And I still, you know, have a Roth IRA. And now I am also doing regular investments with like stocks and bonds and all that stuff. Um, I haven't done, I just have the one where, you know, you just leave it and you forget about it. I don't do the following the stock market. That's a lot for me right now. Maybe eventually one day, but right now I don't think I have the time for that. Um, Stick with your current strategy. It's a good right, one. exactly. Stick with what you know. And so for the most part, I'm doing the same strategies, but just trying to, like I have a Mint app and I also still have an Excel sheet just to kind of visualize where all the money is going. Because I think it's a lot of anxiety of just like, I'm spending way more than 30% of my um, postdoc salary on rent, but I'm okay. So just to, more, it's more of an emotional thing to just feel okay about, I don't have a lot of money and I'm spending a lot on rent but I'm still okay. So yeah. So I'm yeah. For the most part still doing the same thing. Yeah. Okay, great. And what um, frugal strategies are you using? Are you still meal prepping? Definitely. I still meal prep. Um, my mason dress salads are still part of my lunches. Um, I've been, you know, depending on my workout schedule and whether I am consistent with working out, I do breakfast, but, um, so I haven't figured out a meal prepping for breakfast yet. Sometimes it's just a shake. And then dinners, I also still meal prep. I, I've been trying to strategize and trying to figure out whether I need to meal prep all dinners or, cause it's fine for me to eat the same salad for months and years, um, while I'm at work versus when I get home, if it's winter, I don't really want the same food I had yesterday or maybe want something hotter. Um, so it just depends. I'm still trying to figure out dinner, but for the most part, I still don't eat out a whole lot. I still budget whether I have like, this is what I'm going to budget for lifestyle this month. And if it's the second week and I'm, I've gone through that, then I guess we're done eating out for the week or the month or you know hanging out or whatever so I still budget everything for the most part and just try to you know not overspend on things that I don't need I don't really take Ubers the train is pretty reliable in New York unless I'm really really late for something and it's important that I can't be late then I'll take an Uber but for the most part I still take the train everywhere I feel like a lot of people are just like let's Uber I'm like no I'll meet you guys there I'll take the train um you know so yeah there's just a lot of there's so many ways to lose money in New York it's ridiculous so I'm still <laughs> trying to figure that out I've been here about nine months and so I'm still trying to figure out you know going out and not I was a big outdoors person person in PA. So parks and hikes were great. Not so much in New York. Um, although I do live close to a park, but it's not like a hike, you know? So I'm trying to figure out those new things because I know there's a lot of free things in New York. I just need to, you know, figure those out, but I'm still for the most part have a lifestyle and it's just a matter of, again, budgeting that lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, okay. Final question as we, as we wrap up here. So thinking back to yourself, you're starting graduate school, you have a low-ish income coming in for the stipend, you have this debt load. In fact, you even took out a student loan because you were unsure about how things were going to go with your finances. Um, what advice do you have for another person facing that kind of financial challenge um, and also on a grad student kind of income? I mean, I think it's kind of the same things you just summarized. I think apply to everything, everything, no matter how small or large the grants are. Um, Because I think too, also the more grants you apply to, the more, the better you get a grant writing. In the beginning, it may seem like, oh my God, I don't want to write this essay or this statement. But over time, I reuse statements. And as you get, you know, deeper in the program, you learn to write better. So you change things. But for the most part, you never, I never really rewrote a grant from scratch after like my second or third year. Um, So apply for everything, no matter how big or small, don't doubt that you're not going to get it because a lot of grants I got I didn't think I was even eligible Um, especially for diverse um, minority students I think there's so much money for minority students that people just don't even apply to and then they give it to any not anyone but people who actually need it versus people who don't because people who need it don't apply or they don't know about it ask other students because there's so much a lot of the grants I applied to was because another student had applied to it before so imagine one person may not have five or ten grants but if you ask ten different people who had 10 different grants that 10 different grants you can get um so apply for everything um definitely pay off debt while you're in grad school don't let it sit there and whatever money you get don't use it for other lifestyles unless after you pay off your debt so that was one thing i did was paying off 
debt and then whatever was left over I would have for fun travel and stuff like that um, and it's okay to take out a loan in the beginning especially if you want to maybe just if you, especially people who have like a hundred thousand dollars in debt in, grad, in undergrad yes it's not accruing interest but if you want to take out a loan and just pay a lump sum for now and just to get in the habit of like you know paying something down take out the loan and apply for a lot of things have a strategy to pay off the loan before you finish grad school because that loan is going to accrue interest um, but in the long Long run you paid off while you're in grad school and then it like it never existed anyway so apply for everything pay off debt while you're in grad school and do what you need to do to also still balance life and paying off debt because you don't have to be miserable paying off debt and I definitely would also add to that from your story just go after it I mean yeah. you were going after funding you said no to your program no you're not gonna cut my funding I won so much money no you're gonna pay me more um, and you went after your when you're starting, so I know I ask after, but even in the beginning, once I was through the program and seeing behind the scenes, you can ask for more money in the very beginning before you even start grad school. They're not gonna take back your letter and say, well, you're asking for too much, because if they have it, they'll give it. The worst they can say is no. So if they have it, they'll give it, so ask. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I've done one podcast episode on negotiating grad student stipend uh, before in season one. <laughs> Um, I'm planning on releasing another one, actually a compilation of stories in, uh, you know, early months of 2020. So if you're very interested in grad student salary uh, stipend negotiation, please tune into those episodes. Um, but yeah, Indira, you know, thank you so, so much for sharing this story. Uh, where can people find you? So I have been trying to be a lot more active on Instagram. So um, on Instagram, it's just my name, Indira Attorney. So at Indira Attorney, I-N-D-I-R-A-T-U-R-N-E-Y. And it's the same on um, Twitter as well. And I think those are my two main, you know, networking platforms. Um, email Indira.Turney at gmail.com. It's fine. If you want to ask me questions, please reach out. Like I'm always open. Um, like I had mentioned earlier like I've been trying to be more open even about just budgeting on a grad school stipend on Instagram but also I've been also doing a lot of one-on-ones with people just talking about their process because there isn't a one-size-fits-all you know for budgeting because people have different scenarios so if you're interested like sh send me an email reach out to me on social media and I'm happy to answer any questions yeah that's amazing thank you for that work that you're doing um and thanks so much for coming on the podcast today thank you for having me I had a lot of fun <laughs> Listeners, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. PF for PhDs.com slash podcast is the hub for the Personal Finance for PhDs podcast. There, you can find links to all the episode show notes, a form to volunteer to be interviewed, and a way to join the mailing list. I'd love for you to check it out and get more involved. If you want to support the show and my business, please go to pf4phds.com slash help out. There are plenty of ways to do so without laying out any of your own money. See you in the next episode. And remember, you don't have to have a PhD to succeed with personal finance, but it doesn't hurt. The music is Stages of Awakening by Poddington Bear from the Free Music Archive and is shared under CC by NC.